I am Lolly Lewis. I'm the uh, founder of Amateur Music Network, and uh, I'm so glad we're here together to hang out with um, some of my very favorite people, a couple of uh, delightful musicians and, um, <coughs> and human beings, believe it or not. We have both of those, musician and human being today. Um, <laughs> and so uh, we're going to it's going to be a pretty friendly atmosphere because as we've been seeing, a lot of us know each other, but let's stay muted um, and ask questions through chat. We really love to have your input and your questions, and I'll be relaying those into the conversation. But just to get things started, I want to go ahead and hand off to our my co-moderator, Jerry Seamus, and uh, our mentor for today, Rufus Olivier. And I'm just going to let you guys take it from here and talk about uh, where the spirit moves you. Your mentor and tour mentor. Okay. <laughs> hey, Ruth, do you mind if I just say a few words too before you start? Go. Okay. Um, I don't know if you guys are all musicians here and you have those moments where you can think of like, oh, wow, that was just so sublime. And for me, one of those moments was when I first moved to the Bay Area and went to hear the opera. And I was sitting way up in the standing room, only way in the upper balcony. And I heard that bassoon sound and looked down and saw Rufus playing with such passion and commitment. And, um, you know, the orchestra sounded so fabulous and the singers were on stage and it and then years later, I got to play with him for a few years at the opera, and um, it was really transformative. So we're so lucky to have this opportunity to hear from Rufus. And uh, I'm going to hand it off to you, and you can take it away. I'll mute myself and uh, go for it. You muted yourself. we got to teach that to some conductors, you know? Anyway, uh, today, I... I give this talk to a lot of universities and it's about, you know, I, I'll, I'll, it's, it's about a toolkit, a toolkit for, for helping them play, helping them uh, practice. And in this toolkit is broken down into three categories, sound, fingers, and music. Now I know, a lot of you like to play. You like to play for fun. You you enjoy music. You love music. You probably love music more than I love music. Who knows? But uh, you, you, you're playing music. So a lot of times it's hard to get to, to – I, I would like you all to have a great time. When you go to your quintet, when you go to your orchestras, I want you to enjoy it rather than struggle doing it. And so I have a few exercises, some ideas to make it more, more fun, not, not, a, not such a chore to sit down and practice, but to, to actually enjoy practice rather than, and a lot of times, uh, like for instance, sound, you know, we talk about long tones and sound, long tones. Now, I actually believe the long tone is the most boring exercise in the world. And it is, it is for me. So I basically would, I time these things. I time how long does it take me to do these long tones, blah, blah, blah. And then I find out to go from the bottom of my horn to the top of my horn, if the metronome said it, say 67, I can pretty much do all of my long tones in 12 minutes. And when you think 12 minutes, of course, long tone, when you're playing long tones, it feels like an hour. But when you know that it's 10 to 12 minutes, that makes it a little bit easier psychologically in your head, you know? So, you know, oh, okay. So I urge you to do these long tones. Now, after you may do these long tones, you might want to do something fun. Um, don't be afraid to, you know, you don't have to just play, you know, Mozart, Beethoven or whatever. You could play something you like. You can play anything you like, something slow. Try your long tones out on a song. It could be any song. It could be uh, anything you like. I've, I have students, one student that was, so, she was very shy, and I found out that she likes Lady Gaga. So I challenged her to 
come to her lesson the next day and she came to her lesson and she wrote out Lady Gaga and played it for me. But it got the ball rolling. You know what I mean? It gets the ball rolling in, in that direction with the long tones. Um, and when you practice these long tones, your whole goal is to make the easiest, simplest sound possible, natural. You're trying to breathe from your diaphragm through the horn. Think about it. 10 minutes, 12 minutes, put that metronome, 67 or 76, four beats to a note. You can probably cover your horn even faster than me because I have, you know, the bassoon has such a big range. But uh, so sound, and you're trying to get that sound, you want the sound that you want. And the long tones serve another purpose. For me, the long tones get me in touch with my instrument. It makes me feel, after a while, I, I actually feel like I'm inside the horn after a while. You know, like I'm really in touch with the instrument. Like I can direct the air. I feel how the air is going through the horn. And if you do them, it almost becomes a, 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 a meditation. For me, it's like a meditation. Now, I do them with another one of my tools, the, the tuner. You know, that's a good tool to use. And uh, I make sure my attacks, I want to hit my attacks real, uh, where, the, where the tone isn't dipping or, you know, I'm not trying to land into it. I'm trying to nail on the the attack and my releases should be tapered artificial we have to because we're most of us are wind players we have to make an artificial decay we don't we can't do a, a natural decay um, so we make that artificial decay uh, another thing that will make your life better when you go to your rehearsals are your fingers okay you know all the, the technique now, I like to think of technique as maybe, you think I don't think I'm nuts, but I think technique is the easiest thing to do. I could teach a horse to play the bassoon, finger a bassoon. Uh, think of technique is just repetition, repetition, repetition. Um, but also slowly. Now, you could run through, uh, let's say uh, you're practicing, just take one scale that week and you'll play maybe an etude. I know for bassoon players, Mildy, we have our scale studies. So we'll, we'll start on the key of C and we'll work in the key of C just for a week. Arpeggios, thirds, scales, things like that. That's about 10 minutes, 10, 15 minutes of work right there. Um, and sometimes less, you know? But remember to do them slow. Um, when I walk through the hallways of, of the schools, I hear students playing passages, and they, they're they playing them, they're playing them fast, then they mess up, then they do it again, they mess up, they do it again. So what's happening? What is happening? They are literally training themselves to mess up. <laughs> you are training yourself to mess Every time you mess up, go back, mess up. That's what you're training yourself to do. So I tell all my students, I don't care how long it takes you to do this, Mildy. If it takes so long that I could go out, get a pizza, come back, eat it, and you're still playing, that's fine, as long as you don't miss any notes. <laughs> so that's what I mean about slow. Slow practicing is really good. I use a metronome all the time. Another tool for my music toolbox. Uh, I use a metronome. I don't use a metronome too much. I use a metronome so much that I forget to turn it off. And I can look at TV with a metronome going on. I don't even hear it anymore. It's ridiculous. But um, it may even be best for bassoon players because of the awkward fingerings we have, you know, the cross fingers and things like that timing. So the, 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 the metronome, the tuner, and by the way, um, gosh, when I was first starting to play the metronome and the tuner, um, I mean, they weigh, they were a ton. The, the, the tuner was a big box 
that you could heat a cold room with. It had so many tubes and things. But, you know, now we have kids have them on their phones. Same with the metronomes. You can carry them, put them in your pocket. So just consider that part of your musician toolkit. So you've done your sound, you've done your fingers, you got that. So that's what, 20 minutes, half an hour or something like that? Now we come to the, the reason, the whole reason why you're doing all this stuff. And that's the music, the music, the music, the music. Um, when you first play, your, uh, you know, let's say you're going to learn a new piece. You're learning a new piece. You're practicing. Your quintet is practicing. Um, if you're by, you're by yourself, you're learning, you know, take it slow. Do not, do not try and emote and do this and I'm going to be an artist. Forget the art. Forget all that art stuff when you're learning a piece. You're just trying to learn to play that piece. You want to play the notes, you know. You're just trying to play. You're trying to get through a piece. You're trying to get from A to B without having to stop as you know, much as possible. And so I always put the music last because I'm using everything I did before that. So let's say you put a half an hour into your music. Now, I, I tell my students, and this is a good time to do it since we're all locked up. Um, I try and get them to never put their instruments away, especially on the, on the weekends. Just leave your instrument in, uh, on a stand in the room, somewhere where you can see it. <laughs> it's talking to you. You know, it's right there. It's talking to you. It's saying, play me, play me. Uh, you put that instrument in the case and, you know, you know, it's like, you know, leave it out. Leave it out right in front of you so it's screaming at you to play me. And, uh, and you'll, you'll pick it up and play it. All the time, you have to remember, you know, you're, you're playing because you enjoy playing. Um, you enjoy playing. Don't don't look at your horn or your, your violin or whatever and think, don't think of it as work. Change the word. Work is a dirty four-letter word sometimes. We should change it to something. Change it to the name of a candy bar, anything, a Snickers. Let's Snickers. Let's do some Snickers today. But that word work, I'm going to work. Oh, my gosh. Like working on your marriage. Ah, oh, who needs that? But uh, so... You're going to Snickers on your marriage, right? Anyway, um, you see that horn sitting there. Just because I told you to play, you know, scales and long tones all the time doesn't mean you have to do that all the time. Maybe you just want to play a tune, just a simple tune. How can I get a kid to play um, a Mozart if I can't get him to, just, to play... I play a simple, something, a simple tune. Let me see here. I'm going to, I'm switching my mic. I'll show you what I mean. Just nothing. Any tune you like, any tune you want to play. It doesn't matter who it's written for. It doesn't matter. If you like that song, play it. Play it by ear. It's good good ear training. Things like that. Switch that and, switch, uh, Rufus. What? Switch that switch on your mic. Oh, sorry. It's all right. It's okay. I switched the mic. Okay. Um, thank you. Thank you. So, yeah, play... play um, anything you like to play and uh that keeps it interesting you know it keeps it interesting and you, you you can play amazing grace then i can get you to mozart okay i can get you there i can get you to beethoven uh you can play moon river i can get you to mozart and things like that anyway um how how do i practice also a good way to practice and it's it's a little torturous is um to record yourself <laughs> that's good luck with that 
Um, it 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 seems you know it's like hearing your own voice, like oh my god. But I found um, that when I record myself, and not after I've practiced and practiced and then record, but somewhere in the beginning when I'm still learning, when I hear something wrong, I can immediately fix it. And I do that with my students. I'll I'll, I'll record them in their lesson. They hear it and they fix it. Oh my goodness, I didn't know I did that, Mr. Olivier. And they fix it automatically. So with all our devices and our, our little phones and recording and all this stuff, we have the ability to immediately fix a problem immediately. So I, I would you do that. If you have an opportunity to play with a piano, let's, let's say you're um, learning a solo or something, or you're working out some intonation, you don't have to just use the tuner. Sit with the piano. You could pick out each note, listen how you sound with the piano, things like that. Just things to break it up, you know, um, things to make the, to break it up. And uh, anyway, but that's pretty much my spiel on the toolkit for the uh, for playing and, and trying to uh, get some kind of progress at the same time uh, of not feeling like you're being tortured by. The P word, the practice word. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. So. I had, we have a comment from Regina, and I think a lot of people are feeling this way. How is everyone finding the motivation to practice now that we can't play in an ensemble? You know, because I think with the pandemic, that's one of the hardest things to, to still feel motivated to embody being a musician. I, I think um, that's good. If you think, you know, we finished, I went, we had opening night in March of, uh, oh, Midsummer Night's Dream, ballet. Fantastic score, unbelievable. Orchestra was working on all cylinders. Everything was perfect. Opening night, over the speakers after the show, don't come back to work. So I had opening night and closing night in the same night. <laughs> A first. Um, and I've been in my undisclosed location ever since. So um, what am I, how do I stay motivated? Let's, let's, hey, I have a bunch of psychiatrists looking at me right now. I'm going to use you guys as my shrink. I'm asking, I um, been in here playing from soup to nuts and I've been finding, I, I, I don't know why, but I'm enjoying myself. <laughs> I'm enjoying myself because since I've been locked up, I actually feel like I'm making some musical progress. I can feel it when I record and play it back. It's like, oh my gosh, this is better than when I left work. I'm going to be better when I get back to work than when I left. Oh my God. And so uh, for me, that's an inspiration. And if you sort of stick with it, I, I challenge you all, 15 minutes a day, 15 minutes, what the heck, pick it up, play Amazing Grace, and then go look at TV, you know? Um, if, if you say, okay, I'm going to play 15 minutes, I guarantee you it's going to be longer than that. But 15 minutes, no guilt after that. Just and, and once you start seeing yourself get a little better, a little better, you're uh, that being isolated, you can think of it as a time of reflection, of, of looking inward, um, doing your music, enjoying your music. And uh, I, uh, for me, I was telling Jerry and Lolly before we got online, uh, I've been doing this since, you know, since I was 15 years old and playing uh, concerts. So for me, this year is like a weekend off. Um, <laughs> I'm, I've never been home. This I, I'm, I have rooms in my house I've never seen, but uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm uh, for some strange reason I'm enjoying the time to dig into what I do and enjoying it very much. Um, and I'm enjoying this actually, people, actual people. <laughs> Rufus, would you mind if I piped in with a question? Um, this. Yeah good little jumping off point. Um, 
you know, you've played at the opera and the ballet for a good 40 years. And I'm wondering if, have you ever, in, when you're really in the thick of it, looking back on, you know, before the pandemic, had you ever experienced any feelings of burnout? Um, and if so, how you maybe were able to shift away from that? I, I hear what you're saying about now suddenly we've had this time at home for seven months and it feels pretty darn good in a way. Um, just got me to thinking about that. Do you have any comments on that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, um, I don't think you'd be human and not have a burnout in anything you do, uh, whether you like it or not. I mean, uh, um, whether you like it or not. You know, when I first started um, opera, the first season I played started, I, when I left the symphony and I went to play with the opera, you know, the opera was playing almost 13 operas a, se uh, a, a fall, in the fall. We're talking from September to December, 13 operas. We were playing every night. We were playing six nights a week, a different opera every night and rehearsing a different opera every day. So that meant there was doubles every day, including Sunday, we would play Sunday. Imagine playing Meister Singer on Sunday and then coming back after dinner and doing a three and a half hour rehearsal Sunday night. And they, and then they, um, uh, 43 hours off Monday to Tuesday night. And my wife called herself an opera widow at that time, you know, and, uh, uh, so you definitely, definitely could experience a, a burnout, you know, um, some sort of a burnout. Um, fortunately, because the reason why you can be have a burnout is almost the same reason why it's sort of fun to go back because every night it is different. You know, one night you're playing uh, Marriage of Figaro, the next night you're playing Meister Singer, the next night you're playing La Forza del Destino, the next, you know, that's exciting. That's very exciting. It's a, a very, very diverse uh, uh, amount of music. Um, also with the ballet, I think with the ballet, the ballet commissioned so much music, so much new music, uh, so many compositions uh, that no one's ever done. I really enjoy that. We record music that no one has recorded. It's not just the same recording and the same Schubert fifth at 500 albums. No, we the first time recordings of these pieces. And I enjoy that a lot. Um, but yeah, you can, you can experience, uh, I mean, you do have to uh, step back for a little bit, but uh, it's never caused me to uh, ever think I don't want to do this anymore ever. Um, you know, first of all, this is all I can do. <laughs> That helps a lot when this is all you can do. Um, yeah. So yeah, but uh, I don't. I don't have any. Um, I don't have any burnout. Um, I don't feel any burnout. You know. Uh, great. Except when, except when I play French opera. <laughs> you Carmen. Carmen is why for French operas. Check this out. Next time you go see a French opera, and I know some of you may love French opera. But there are so many um, false endings in French opera. You think it's over and it just keeps going. <laughs> you look at the clarinet player and you roll your eyes. It's never going to end. So uh, <laughs> stay away from French opera festivals, okay? <laughs> we have some folks kind of want to get into the weeds on some, um, on some technical stuff. But before we pivot... One thing I just wanted to point out, for a lot of amateur musicians, I think some of the uh, mental exercise of why am I playing has to do with, I'm not, who, oh, sorry, who am I playing for? Like, am I playing for myself? If I'm not playing for an audience, why am I playing? And I think that issue of, of uh, kind of what, what's the motivation as a musician is important to be able to enjoy just, you know, maybe even just walking out on your front porch and like you were playing earlier, you were playing Amazing Grace, just going out and playing a little something 
to the to the you know to the yeah. leaves in your garden or something. Right. Well, it's um you know I have some friends that uh, retired and um, a few in particular and. He would call me, we would talk, and he says, you know, Roof, I, I get up every morning and I still play my elbow every morning. He says, what am I doing? You know, why am I still, I don't do concerts anymore. I just get up and I play my elbow every morning. Am I an idiot? Am I a fool? And I just tell him, I says, you know what? That's what you do. That's what you do. Um, that's who you are. You don't have to have a reason to play. You, you play because you like to play. Uh, it's just that simple. Um, I'm not, personally, I'm not missing an audience or anything like that. Um, some of the greatest moments I've ever had in 43 years have been in these little rooms right here when no one is heard. No one um, has been there. Um, I, don't, I don't know if I'm playing for myself as much as just... I just feel good. I just feel good. Uh, you know, if I don't play, let me tell you something. <laughs> don't tell anybody. It's a secret. But if I don't play my horn, my wife won't let me in the house, okay? She, 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 if I come in there, she, she, she knows. She says, Do you, have you played today? I said, well, why would you say that? She says, because you're acting funny, you know, a little snippy. Go play something and then come back. And so... Um, uh, you know, this is, uh, for, for me, it's, 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 a, an addiction almost. Uh, I, 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 I don't know what to do. Um, would I be able to retire? Yes. And I know that because I feel like I'm retired now, but I still plan and I'm fine. Um, and I, it doesn't matter who here, for me, it doesn't matter if anybody's around. I'm just doing my thing in here, having a good time. Um, as long as my family's fine, I'm fine, you know. But just play for yourself, play, play, and, and go out on your deck and play some notes. The neighbors would love it, you know. Neighbors would love it. I think my neighbors would throw rocks at me, but the neighbors would love you guys. <laughs> yeah. Um, looks like we have some chat questions. Lolly, should I go ahead and read those? Oh, I think... Lolly's muted. I'll go ahead and read them. Okay. So this is from Wendy. Sorry about that. Wendy Jacobson. Um, if we had 15 minutes only for warm up, what would you do? What would you recommend? And then she also had another question. What are your thoughts about legere bassoon reads? Um, and oh, very good. Let's start with that. Um, and we have a couple more questions. Okay. Yeah. If I, and, and oftentimes because of the commute, I do have only 15 minutes or 10 minutes if I'm lucky for a warm up. Um, the perfect warm up for me is to do a, some long tones and then um, I play an etude, something like that before I, before I play. But if I only have 15 minutes, I'm just gonna do the long tones. The long tones are gonna put me in touch with my horn. It's gonna make me it's going to put me in touch with the horn and make me feel part of the horn and everything else will follow. Uh, it's, it's, uh, when you're not warmed up right and you feel disconnected from the horn, it doesn't matter how many scales you play, but when you play those long tones, you get into the horn, you get, you feel part of the instrument, you know, and I use it. Yeah, I might as well just be, mm, that's the way I feel about long tone. Mm, I feel like it's one of those things, you know, and, uh, and, and I get into that mode, you know, sometimes I put my feet in some hot water. I don't know. It gets kinky. Go on. Great. All right. Let's see. Um, this is from Bob Kostler. So he writes, I retired and took up the bassoon as a 60 plus year old, having never played an instrument. Any suggestions for someone who is learning to sight read, learn rhythm, and voice this beautiful instrument? Oh, that's wonderful. Well, congratulations. You have, you have come to the other side. <laughs> um, <laughs> good for you. You know, this is good for you. Taking up an instrument is going to keep the old noggin 
good. I think we have a brain doctor around somewhere. But uh, the the taking up that instrument is really going to keep that plaque off the off the brain. And um, some tips for starting out. Let's go to the Leger reed. I think you should use a Leger plastic reed because now you won't have to deal with reeds. I carry a Leger reed in my bassoon case. Um, it works very well. It's uh, for me. It's a backup for my some of my colleagues. Is their main reed, you know, and they sound fabulous on it. It's all what you want to play, but I would definitely go with an artificial reed so you're not fighting that stupid reed trying to play. I, that's the biggest tip I could give you. Get a good Leger reed, uh, art, and, and then you'll be able to do your long tones. Play some long tone, play some scales, play some simple songs. Do everything slow. Play songs you like. And uh, but, but I would definitely get a, a read trying to get past that read thing and playing is really uh, can be an obstacle you know unless you have a supply somebody making reads for you um but um that might answer the leger question also um i would i would i would look into that not cheap but i think they might be worth it especially if you're starting out fresh that that would be a good idea Excellent. Um, Rufus, I have a question for you. Um, that it's a little bit related to the reeds situation. Um, I remember at the opera, sometimes you would change vocals even before a specific solo that was maybe in a different register. Um, is that something you recommend for students? Me? Change vocals? Me? <laughs> <laughs> Well, that answers that question. So, yep. uh, yeah, you know, <laughs> let me tell you something. You can't have any pride and play the bassoon, okay? There's no, there's no, you got to do what you got to do, okay? If, if, you're, if you're your reads not hitting that high D, you better find a way to make it hit that high D. I'll tell you a story, little story, short story. We're, we're, we're playing a this this brand new piece, it's Otello, Otello, the ballet, and the composer starts one of the movements. Uh, for all you bassoon players, he, he starts one of the movements with the bassoon on a high E, and then six pianos underneath the high E. Okay, the next day we're supposed to record this thing. Okay, you talk about cheating. Um, I found an old vocal. I drilled a hole in that sucker, put a little device on the tip the night before with a little handle. I'd show it to you. And in order to, I could, I had to play the high E and then come down chromatically on a scale. Now with the hole in the vocal, it's impossible to do. So I made a device. So the second bassoon player, after I hit the high E, he reaches over and he closes the valve, and then I can move off the note, okay? I'll do anything. I have no pride whatsoever about making it work. So, yeah, I'll change a vocal. I'll change anything if it works. <laughs> so, there you go. So you gotta get great. <laughs> Greg Barber. You see Greg. I remember when Greg looked over, and he, he saw this thing hanging off my vocal, and He's like, what the heck is that? I said, that's, that's what you were going to pull when I play that E. And that's you pull part. that thing, pull that lever, and I can pop off that E. And we were a team. <laughs> Forehand bassoon playing. That's right. <laughs> well, um, speaking of teams, I was wondering if you had any, well, this is a three-part question. Okay. Over the years, uh, let's stick with the opera for now. Um, sure. Any favorite conductor that comes to mind? Any favorite singers? And also, who are the favorite composers of the opera repertoire you've played? So that's a lot you can. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Sure. Well, the singers, uh, you know, it's hard to even say favorite because, you know, the singers, my opening night, I think my opening night was Samson and Delilah back in 1980. And Domingo and Shirley Verrett were singing. So 
that was incredible. And then the next night, you know, Leontine Price was singing. And then the next night was, you know, Dame Sutherland. Cavalier the next night. I don't know who the favorite. I'll tell you one of the most exciting nights I've ever had in my life. Is, uh, we were doing Aida Pavarotti and Margaret Price were singing. And Margaret Price is a fabulous singer, of course. But she got sick. And Leontine Price was in town to do the Carmelites. Um, so she's famous for her Aida. So she stepped in. Now, these tickets, by the way, back in the 80s were being scalped for $1,200. And one night, for that one night, uh, Leontine Price stepped in for Margaret Price with Pavarotti. And... Uh, I to this day, I the hair on the back of my neck is standing up. The the ovations in between the acts went for fifteen to twenty minutes. I'm not kidding. It was the most unbelievable thing I'd ever seen. The other night, I remember an opening night where we we're doing Otello, and our Otello got sick, and so the opening night we had to fly Domingo in from New York on a jet and opening night didn't start till about 11 p.m. that night. We just sort of sat around drinking and playing cards. Well, not me, of course. And, uh, you know, and uh, that was exciting. That was exciting. He walked in, he, he gets out of a highway patrol car in full costume. They dressed him on the plane and walks on the stage and sings Othello. And we played that thing from 11 to two in the morning or something like that. That was fun. That was exciting. That was one of a great moment. Conductors, I think, I think um, Tim McCarnoff and Gergiev may be my favorites. Uh, Gergiev, uh, Gergiev, uh, San Francisco brought Gergiev. The opera brought Gergiev to, to the United States, and he was uh, our principal guest conductor for a while before he was famous. And once he got famous, of course, the Met sewed him up with a contract that he couldn't come back and play with us. But we did War and Peace with him, Angel, and and uh, he brought his incredible singers who are now famous. But Gergiev and Tim McCarnoff, who was Gergiev's teacher, were probably the most unbelievable artists. Um, Gergiev, for instance, if you ask Gergiev a question, um, Maestro, do you want me to play this blah, 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 soft? How do you want me? And he would just say, look, Watch me doing the show. I will show it to you. And that was it. And he would. He could show you what to do just from the podium in the moment. It was fabulous. Gergiev. Um, yeah. Anything else? What was the other part? I don't, I don't remember the other part. Um, composer. Favorite opera composer. Oh, oh yeah. I, I, I don't know. I really don't know. Um, you know, I listened to that Poulain Carmelites, and of course the Mozart. Um, the Mozart is ridiculous. We're playing um, whenever we're playing Marriage of Figaro. I drive my, I drive the second bassoon player nuts because I every after every piece I turn to him and go, hey, "This is friggin' believable." And, and pretty soon he goes, "You know, man, they're all it's all unbelievable." Okay, so just shut up. Okay, it's 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 all incredible. Um, and then there, you know, I just don't know. It, it depends. Uh, it's easily, you know, I could say the pet answer. Well, my favorite opera is the one that I'm playing at the moment. That's, you know, come on. And, uh, I'm not going to do that, but, uh, um, you know, every year I make a cake for myself. It's, it's, it's yellow with chocolate frosting every year. And I like to do it myself because everybody else messes it up. And I cut a piece, I eat it, and then my wife gets mad. She says, you make this big cake and you only eat one piece. And she says, well, why? I says, because it's my favorite cake. <laughs> if I eat too much, it's not going to be my favorite anymore. So, uh, <laughs> she <laughs> but, so it's, you know, the variety... I have no real favorites. I really enjoy playing Mozart. I really enjoy playing Shostakovich, Lady Macbeth. I really enjoy playing Puccini. Um, um, 
it's very, very hard to, to know what's my favorite, really how much, favorite. How much can you hear the singers from down in the pit? Oh, everything. Oh, everything. Um, right. I remember doing Aida. We're doing Aida. And, you know, uh, the bassoon players will know you're playing the obligato with the with the singer and and you have to play with that singer you know it doesn't matter who's good you're not you're not the conductor means nothing to you at that point you were playing with the singer one night she jumped the bar and you're there you have to be there you jump with her you you jump that cliff with her and nobody's supposed to know you know so don't tell anybody okay yeah but you can hear everything everything mm -hmm. So Danielle was curious about some long tone demonstrations. Is that something you'd like to do? Sure. Long tone demonstrations. <laughs> Maybe you could talk through some of your long tone routine. Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll just show you. Um, one of the exercises I like to use is I'll, 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 I'm, I'm going to press the button. So I don't overdo it, but um, so I'll just I'll just demonstrate um, what I like to do it, just for a few bars. like that you can do you can um have um crescendos diminuendos to that you can um practice your vibrato do it with vibrato if you want without i actually when i practice vibrato i actually use i actually do it metronomically so you will hear the beats It shouldn't sound good. It shouldn't sound great. When you're practicing, don't be, don't, don't worry about sounding great. Practicing is practicing. You know, it's, it, this is not performing. Uh, when I'm doing certain exercises, it sounds goofy. So helps me get control of the vibrato. It gives it, it 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 works those muscles that will control the vibrato. So I'm I'm working the muscles to control the vibrato, but um, I'll do that exercise all the way to the top of the horn. It pretty much covers the horn, takes about 12 minutes, gets me in touch with the instrument. And then, and then, um, um, then I'll maybe play something, um, play something slow. something slow to to exercise that those long tones and stuff like that Boop. yeah thanks that's great thank you yeah no problem no problem at all <laughs> wendy jacobson says that one time somebody something flew off the stage and broke your vocal is that true it's true it is true How um scary. oh yeah it's okay it uh we were we were doing uh elixir the elixir of love and i don't know if every um bassoon players know that piece because it has a, it has the unit for kiva 
So it has this big solo in it, right? So I play this thing, I play this solo, and I'm just sitting there right afterwards. All of a sudden, a football comes off the stage, hits my vocal, cracks the reed right in half. The vocal is down at this angle now, and I can't play anymore. <laughs> I wow. can't play it. I can't play the, 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 the reed is split. There's nothing I can do. I have, I am not, you know, I'm I done. The solo was over. The solo had just finished. The opera was almost over. So I just sit there and enjoy, I sat there and enjoyed the opera. The backstory to that, afterwards, you know, the, 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 we have all these committees. The committee, the, the player committee, everybody, everybody was up in arms. Suddenly a football flew off the stage. Uh, <laughs> everybody was all upset and running around like crazy. I wasn't upset. You know, but everybody, the manager, Gockley, came down. They were huddled in a circle. What are we going to do? How can we do a bubble? Football's flying off the stage. And then when I walked, when I walked out of the, when I walked out of the um, opera house, the singer that threw the football was standing there shaking. And his friend said, hey, that guy's going to kick your ass, man. You, you broke his vocal. And <laughs> I just walked up to the dude and hugged him. I said, man, don't worry about it. You can fix the vocal, okay? <laughs> but yeah, it happened. <laughs> it's true. That's quite a story. Hey, uh, Rufus, one quick thing. Um, for many of you who um, go to the opera and enjoy the opera, this weekend the opera is going to be live, not live streaming, but streaming. Uh, Tosca, I'm not sure what year that performance is from, but I saw that it came across... Um, an email this morning and it did remind me of an anecdote that Rufus told me about Tosca that when you first joined the opera Rufus I recall you were one of your first things you did was Tosca and you said that you know the opening page of Tosca is very complex rhythmically and the whole page went by and you had no idea what was going on which is really a, a testament um, I know a lot of your background is probably coming from a more symphonic life where things are a little bit more regular and familiar repertoire wise, but learning that opera repertoire for the first time, I bet, I imagine those first few years were very, very challenging. And I wondered if you could just talk about the difference between symphonic versus end chamber, I guess, versus playing. You alluded to some of that earlier. Yeah. Yeah. The, uh, I, I remember that the, uh, Maurizio Arena was conducting, and Tosca starts, the conductor just does this. And I was playing with the, uh, the older opera orchestra that they know this stuff backwards and forwards. I was fortunate enough to play, you know, with all, all those. So he flicks, his, he flicks his, his baton. The orchestra takes off like a horse that's been slapped. And by the time I even put the horn in my mouth, they're at the bottom of the page. <laughs> and Bill Fath leans over and says, welcome to the orchestra, kid. You know? <laughs> oh, true love, right? But uh, as far as symphony, opera, and chamber music, modern music, uh, so I've played you know, symphony, LA, San Francisco, opera, ballet. I've played everything now. Um, quintet, I've been in a quintet for 25 years and contemporary music players for 25 years. Um, so I approach every one of those jobs or those, those um, things the same way uh, a good guy, a good field goal kicker kicks the ball. <laughs> I, I heard a kicker on the radio. I, I forget his name, but somebody asked him, how do you kick the ball? I mean, when you're 10 yards away and 50 yards away. And he said, well, 
I kick the ball the same way. I kick the ball exactly the same way, whether I'm 10 yards away or 50 yards. And it made total sense to me. My approach to all of it all starts with the chamber music. All starts in that quintet and that trio. That's, that's where you learn how to play. In those, in those small groups, those duets, those trios, those quintets, that's where you really work out. Um, you know, uh, some of you know when you, you, have, you, you play in your little groups and then you go to an orchestra, most of the women players are just sitting there a lot of the times while everybody else is rehearsing the strings, you know. Uh, but in these quintets, you're on the spot. You are, you, you're on the spot all the time. You're learning how to maneuver and weave in between. My job as a bassoonist, I feel my job, my opinion, is somewhat like, uh, I call it the mortar between the bricks of the woodwind section. I feel like I have a responsibility to support and make everybody around me sound better without them knowing it, of course. But uh, I am the mortar between the bricks. Sure, you have to step out and you play a solo at this, the bassoons have a big moment. But 90% of my job is supporting my flute player, my oboe player, my clarinet player, anybody around and trying to make them shine, you know. And, and if you can do that without them knowing you did it, then you, you've done your job. You know, they shouldn't, you should get in and out and nobody should, mission impossible. Get in and out and they shouldn't know you were there. But uh, I do that in the symphony. I do that in the quintet. Uh, I do that in the, in the ballet and the opera. And secretly, and don't tell anybody, I'm actually controlling everything. But they don't know it. Oh, that's weird. <laughs> Somebody knew it. <laughs> that's, yeah. That's really great, though. I love that story because it just shows, to me, that's what musicality is. You know, getting in and being being part of something and making it better without it having to be about you. Yeah, yeah, exactly. The, and, and the chamber music, I, I recommend uh, chamber music. Play as much as possible. It makes your life so much easier in the orchestra. Uh, it'll help the orchestra playing so much when you play the chamber music, um, you know, playing duets, reacting. If you can learn, if you can learn your music well enough to not have to think about yourself too much and hear what somebody else is doing, that's you really, you really gotten some things done. That's uh, listen to. I enjoy listening to my colleagues. You know, they inspire me. So uh, it's not hard for me to listen. That's know. great. That's that's terrific. I yeah. think that's a pretty good place to uh, leave it. If we had any have any other questions, we've um, we've got just a moment. Um, I also want to point out uh, what you were saying about how the bassoon is sort of the just makes the whole section. It's you know bassoon is a continuo instrument, and it comes you know right out of uh, that uh, bass section and oh, yeah. and so i want to point out for all you bassoonists we've got a workshop next weekend with william skeen who's a baroque cellist and he's going to be talking about baroque bass lines and how to shape the bass line and i think you bassoon players might find that really interesting so i invite you to join us for that oh, yeah fantastic um, yeah the bassoon uh, is the is the is the bass line and the drummer in a quintet you do both jobs Yes, exactly. So, um, Jerry, this was really uh, wonderful. Thank you for joining us. And Rufus, thank you so much for sharing uh, your uh, undisclosed location with us. <laughs> we promise not to tell anyone. Don't tell anybody. I have enemies. <laughs> right. I doubt that. Somehow I really doubt that. I don't know. I got to watch out for that Alan Shonkoff. You know, they talk about that guy. <laughs> oh. Okay, everybody. It looks like that's, uh, yes, bravo, Rufus, says Alan Shonkoff. Everybody's thanking you. Thank you so much. Thank this you. Really Thank fun. you all.
Yeah. I had a blast. You made my day. I'm going to really, live really on this for a month. Our day. <laughs> Fantastic. Take care. Thanks Stay so safe. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.